and welcome to this uh, Waterloo Smarter Health Seminar. I'm Shirley Fenton, Managing Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. Thank you for joining us today for this last seminar in 2008. I'd like to welcome our web viewers and the Ontario Telehealth Network sites. As you know, this seminar is being recorded and is being broadcast over the web. So we ask that you hold your questions to after the seminar presentation so that we can get a real or virtual mic to you. A very warm welcome to our guest speaker today, Mr. Stephen Walker. Uh, we'll introduce Steve in just a minute. We're very pleased that the Lawson Health Research Institute in uh, London, Ontario is co-hosting these seminars. I'd also like to acknowledge our seminar series sponsors, Borden Ladner Gervais, McKesson, and Healthcare Information Management and Communications Canada. We could not host these seminars without their support and we're very grateful to them. I have one brief announcement. Our next seminar in this series will be on Wednesday, January the 28th, and we'll be announcing details about this shortly. This seminar series has focused on the many facets and faces of health informatics. We have all enjoyed these interesting and thoughtful seminars, and we're really looking forward to today's presentation on healthcare, biobank, and research information systems in the UK. The agenda is as follows. I will introduce Steve. Steve will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then this will be followed by a facilitated discussion. So if you have a question, please signal to us and we'll get a mic to you. We also invite our web and teleconference viewers to please send in their questions. So it is my pleasure to introduce Steve. I've gotten to know Steve uh, a little bit better over the last uh, day, and a, uh, day and a half. Steve became CIO of UK Biobank in 2004 after leaving the National Health Service in which he, he served 31 years. I hope it wasn't a prison sentence. <laughs> in April 2006, he became the implement, Implementation Program Director to lead the development of new systems to support R&D management for the National Institute for Health Research. In this role, he is working within the UK Clinical Research Networking Network Coordinating Centre, developing and coordinating clinical research networks in the UK. He is also the IS Director for this organization, which is based at the University of Leeds. Previously, Steve led the, uh, the Project, uh, Project Connect program that was responsible for the ses successful connection of GP practices in England to NHSNet. Steve has a broad range of experience. He's worked in hospitals and primary care organization in management, finance, and IT roles. What spare time he has with all of these jobs that he's doing, he is also a lover of music and owns an extensive guitar collection. Maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that. And in October 2008, uh, and this must be uh, very justly awarded, Steve was awarded the honorary title of Professor of Healthcare at the University of Manchester. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to, you to welcome Stephen Walker. Thank you, Shirley. Um, this is a rare honor and an opportunity for me to talk about what I've been doing for the last few years and actually back over the last 30 odd years. Uh, and because I've had a very interesting journey to arrive here in Waterloo, I've had plenty of time to think about what I want to say and how I want to say it, and to tinker with my presentation, which I've done endlessly as I've driven here from Philadelphia. Um, and the preamble for this, um, which, which surely has more or less told you about, is I, I did work in, in the health service in England for 31 years, which looking back doesn't feel all that long, but to people who are a lot younger than me probably feels more than a life sentence. Uh, and I started in finance and I've worked in performance management and I've had a particular involvement and a particular interest in primary care, which I think will come through this talk. And I've worked in systems development and, and program management. Um, I left to join Biobank. I thought I was escaping the NHS 
I thought, for reasons that I'll talk about throughout this talk, that um, it was time for me to move into a more considered and perhaps a more sedate academic environment where I could play guitar and I could play golf occasionally. But it was not to be. Um, I got pulled back into the um, NHS to lead these new research and development um, infrastructure initiatives. Um, and that has been quite a challenge. That's required me to understand a fundamentally new environment to the one that I'd worked in before. And so pulling all of that together, what is it that I want to talk about? I want to talk about the whole of that. I want to look back across that and think about lessons that I might have learned that might be worth telling you about. Although I have to say that talking to Dominic and other people this morning, it feels as if I might be telling you about experiences in a third world country, because I think in some of these areas you may um, be a little bit ahead of the game, and my hope is that by telling you about some of what we've done that, that could be done better, we'll be passing on useful information. But a theme that underpins what I want to talk about is something that actually is quite important to me, which is that we need to look at this genuinely from the point of view of patients. And patients are not, as far as I can tell, another set of people that we talk to periodically. P patients are everybody. And one of the things I've brought to my jobs is that I get sick a lot. And as I get older, I get sick more. And that forces you to look at the way in which the massive investment in information systems that we've made does or does not help the speed, the efficiency, and the quality of care you get. And so the whole of this is affected by my experiences as a patient. And as I drove north through America, the one thing I played with was the pictures. And I started to have fun with that, and I started to look for pictures that were relevant to every slide. So in terms of what am I, uh, in, in, I'm a program director. I'm a director of information systems. I'm a performance manager, which means in the NHS, in the UK, we have government targets. You need performance managers to make sure that the NHS delivers against those targets. This is about the carrot and stick approach to making sure that things get done. If you ask me what would I do if people would only go away and leave me to do it, well, apart from playing golf and apart from playing guitar, I would do this. I would develop applications. I would code stuff. I would work on databases. I would work as a business analyst. And I, I've quite often said that in my whole career and with the qualifications I've got, there are only three things that have really made a difference to how I think and how I behave. One was passing my 11 plus, which is the exam you take between junior school and higher school, which allowed me to go to grammar school. The other was passing my driving test. And the other was learning what business analysis was all about and the fundamental structured thinking that goes behind the discipline of business analysis. Uh, I happen to have a degree in medical information systems. And a thing that has made my mother possibly the happiest woman in Cheshire for a little while was when this, this appeared out of the blue. I did tell her, in view of all of medical conditions, a professor of healthcare didn't mean I had to touch people. Um, and I am also this, I'm a failed accountant. I started as an accountant, I remember one night at midnight standing in my back bedroom, banging my head on the wall thinking, why do I need to learn about company taxation? And I gave up. But actually the skills I learned in management accounting and, and stuff have, have served me quite well throughout my career. And this point, this bottom point is important. I am a simple program project manager. I am not a scientist. Dominic talked about stuff over dinner last night that I would struggle to comprehend at any time. So I'm not a scientist, but I am clearly working in a domain that is full of eminent scientists. But who am I and how do I work? And again, I tell you the pictures are vaguely relevant. The reference for my last job, this was a national program director job. The reference was sought by the Director General of Health uh, Research and Development in England. The reference said, Steve is effective. He has delivered many national information systems programs. 
but he is very difficult to work with. Because I have strong views about things that don't always fit corporately, and I generally summon the bravery to put my hand in the air and say, the emperor has got no clothes on. I'm impatient because I think the rich potential for systems to deliver better health care in many ways is being missed. I'm minimalist in that I never want an empire. If I could do this with me and my three Irish setters running it from out of my back bedroom, I would run the whole program on that basis. Therefore, it's very scary to me that I've got a team of 55 people at the moment. Scary because that means that 70% of my effort goes into running that team and not doing what I want to do. And therefore, having reached a tipping point, probably what I'll do is split that team in half and we'll make it smaller and get, make it more effective. And I think what I'm also interested in is this bit, creativity. The ability to say, at the end of the day, we have done this. Project management, program management, risk management, and all of the paraphernalia that goes with it is only designed to make sure we deliver the right applications at the right price at the right time for the right people. And it's important to me that I create teams whose focus is on the creation of those applications. And I'm a builder of tribes. The way in which I seem to have been able to do this is I've brought to myself people who share those views. Not people who are just team members, but people who believe in what we're trying to do to the point that when life gets difficult, they're capable of resisting that. Uh, and, and sticking with the idea and holding the nerve and continuing to deliver. And that to me is almost more of a tribe mentality than it is a team mentality. Oh, and guess what? I'm a patient. Like my mother, like my wife, like everybody I know, I'm a patient and I'm a receiver of the services that these systems are supposed to deliver. My career is unplanned. When I started my career in the health service and finance, everybody had a plan that they wanted to be a director of finance within 10 years. I never had a plan, ever. Things just happened. I worked in hospital finance. I ran uh, management information systems in hospitals, in laboratories, in pharmacies. I ran mainframe computers. I worked in primary care in the northwest of England, so the geographic scope's increasing. I worked with GPs. I worked on government initiatives to fund GPs and to fund the organizations that manage GPs. Um, I worked in telecoms. This was bizarre. Um, I, I led, ultimately, the project which had a business case of £468 million pounds to connect every GP practice in England to the NHS network securely. Big, big, big infrastructure project. We had to renegotiate national contracts for telecoms. We had to by thousands and thousands of computers. All of that was relatively straightforward logistics work, but the big challenge was how do you change behaviours in general practice to take advantage of that infrastructure and that connection that you've just given them. And we did pretty innovative work on that, and we built on the back of that the ability to transmit all lab results from hospitals and integrate them into patient records. I then moved to work for the National Programme for IT, the big new programme in England that started up in 2003, where I was the Assistant Director of Primary Care. And I led the first phase of the Electronic Transmission of Prescriptions project, the aim of which was to make 650 million paper prescriptions per year electronic. And I wrote the business case for it, and the business case said, don't do it. So I went to ministers in England and said, um, Here's the business case. And they said, are you saying don't do it? I said, yes, can I go now? And I was let off the hook. And the reality is that four years later, it's still not been done. Because the business case isn't thought through. And um, what I was saying is that you can't build the business case off the back of the patient benefit. The business case is around the back office benefit of streamlining the systems and so on. You can't get much better than the piece of paper that I can read, that I can take to any pharmacy I want and get the drugs. That bit of the business process works. So that was interesting. I worked on the new contract for GPs. I worked on decision support um, systems for GPs in this thing called Prodigy. Then I left and did UK Biobank, and then I got seconded from UK Biobank while still doing it to work for the National Institute of Health Research and the UK Clinical Research Networks. And it's those two bits 
that I want to talk about with a little bit of a flavour of the environment in which those are working. So I meant the Arc de Triomphe picture down here in the bottom right hand corner rather in the context of the Tour de France cycle race. Not from the point of view of getting to the grand end but for God's sake at some point getting to the end of a gruelling race. Um, so context and background. The map at the top here is England, the red blob is Cheshire and I live in the middle of Cheshire. London is down in the bottom right as you know. The pictures um, are increasingly relevant and this bottom right hand one with the nice hill and the nice lake is about 200 yards from my house. And that's where I'm looking forward to going home to on Saturday. So I work in England, I've worked on Biobank which is England, Scotland and Wales and my base is from Macclesfield and I've now reached a position where I can open offices where I live which is a rare treat and luxury after years of commuting. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now briefly to give me context for the rest of the talk is this research, um, this um, national program for IT, the Connecting for Health program and in particular a bit of that called the Research Capability program. And this is by way of preamble and context for what I want to say about R&D management systems and about UK Biobank. So the headlines, who in the room has not heard about the UK's investment in health systems infrastructure. Okay, for your benefit I will explain some of it. It's something that achieves headlines in the press in the UK very frequently. And I have to say that they're not always complimentary headlines and they're always headlines that involve things like the a national Audit Office and this value for money being achieved and there's things on target and, uh, and so on. It is allegedly the largest and most expensive civilian IT project in the world. It's implementing infrastructure and applications across the whole NHS in hospitals, in primary care and it's doing this via very, very big multi-billion pound contracts with major suppliers like CSC, Fujitsu, British Telecom and so on. As I said, it's had intense public um, and media scrutiny and I was uh, a part of that program until 2004. And because of the scale of it, because of the approach of it, because of the fact that it's building national infrastructure that will allow people to book hospital appointments in one end of the country when they live in the other end of the country, uh, it's not surprising that it's, it's seen as high profile. And what it's intended to deliver is the care record service which is about the sharing of clinical data where appropriate across England, about the ability for patients and GPs to book hospital appointments using online booking systems um, regardless of where they might live or where their treatment might be. It's about the ability as I talked about a few minutes ago to make prescribing completely electronic to build infrastructure to allow this, secure infrastructure to allow this data to flow. The most successful bit of it so far actually has been in this digital imaging area where uh, the implementation of digital x-rays and, and scanning in hospitals has, has really started to deliver patient benefit. It's about the ability to transmit patient records from one GP practice to another when a patient moves uh, practices. And it's about linking the whole NHS with directory services and email. So it's a big project. The, the budget in the headlines is around about £9 billion. And allegedly it's um, two, three years behind schedule. A component of this programme and a new component that's been funded by the Department of Health is this thing called the Research Capability Programme. So what people are starting to think about now is having started to collect good structured data at a hospital and a primary care level, how might that data be used to support research? What would need to be done to it? What permissions would need to be set um, in order for researchers to be able to use that data? And I think the UK is, is probably uniquely positioned to start to build this sort of infrastructure. It's a program that's in its formative 
phasers. It's designed to enable more people to be recruited into clinical trials and, and studies. It's designed to inform the, uh, the public more about trials and studies and engage them in it and support public health initiatives. It's very structured in its approach. It's very, very focused on the real issues to do with preserving the security and confidentiality of data. And interestingly, one piece of string that joins to another piece of string, it should be the provider of data to support UK Biobank in follow-up of its participants. So this is about clinical information support research. Which leads me on to Biobank, which is the big research project that I'm directly involved in. Has anybody heard of UK Biobank? Okay, so I'll, I'll start from first principles. The aim of UK Biobank at this time is to recruit half a million members of the public in England, Scotland and Wales. To retrieve from those people within our assessment centres or clinics various, measure various measurements, lots of data and physical samples. And to put that data in a secure data repository and to put those samples into secure data uh, sample stores. And to follow up the health of those 500,000 people for 10, 20, 30 years so that we can start to have a very detailed picture of the interactions between lifestyle, health, genetics and environmental factors. And having established this bank, and, and, and the term bank is important because that's literally what it is. It's a bank that people can put in to deposit, put in deposits and, and withdraw information to provide access to that bank for researchers to examine those links. And the point of all that is so that researchers can address questions like this. How many samples have you got in UK Biobank for men of a certain age who drink a lot of alcohol of a particular type, have so many children, have taken a particular drug, live within 25 miles of a coal mine, have a family history of asthma? And the answer might be 1,653 samples, and the researcher might say, well, please, could you withdraw these, those samples? Please, can you do, this, um, do these tests on them and feed the results back to us? Because they've got a particular interest in the factors that there are there. So we've got lifestyle information, we've got measurements, we've got family history, we've got follow-up data, we've got medications, and we've got everything that can be derived from those physical samples. And apart from supporting research in that way, with something of this scale, it's inevitable that it should have significant public health potential. We should know more about obesity, we should know more about common conditions than we do at the moment. And I've been talking to various people over the last day about what is UK Biobank, and lo and behold, that is what it is. It is not glamorous, it doesn't have gleaming spires or um, lawns and fountains or anything else. It's a Staples look-alike building on the outskirts of Manchester which is full of liquid nitrogen freezers, secure data stores, minus 80 freezers and robots. So the objectives of Biobank um, I've told you about. The funders of Biobank actually are here. This was funded up front to do the recruitment phase um, by a variety of bodies. Began recruitment in 2007. It's only funded for recruitment, so the next phase, when the resource starts to be used, will have a different business model. The cohort is 500,000 people in that age range. People have said, well, why don't you do 18-year-olds because we're interested in um, factors applying to younger people. The answer is that this is the age where it was considered that most interesting events start to happen to people. And the lines had to be drawn at some point, I think. <coughs> it's designed for use by academia, by healthcare and industry. And it's very clear, if you look at the motivating factor for why members of the public join in this, it's to improve the health of future generations. 
And one thing they're focused on is to improve the health of future generations by new drug discovery. So by implication, it's critical that people working in pharmaceuticals should have access to this resource. Current status. We have had clinics in all of these locations. The green ones are currently open, the red ones have been open and closed down. So they're peripatetic, they're open for a period and then they close. This was as at the 9th of October. In 15 months, 16 months at that point, we'd recruited 185,000. We're now up to 215,000. These are big numbers, and Biobank is now becoming real. You can see that we've also got information on how many letters sent. We've sent out 3.5 million letters inviting people to participate. Um, how many operational days we've got, what our DNA rate is, and, and so on. In any one centre per day, the average is 96 participants. So this is quite a high throughput process. The systems architecture I'll go through quickly, but suffice to say, we have had to get information on the names of addresses of people in that age range. We have had to process that information and clean it. We've had to develop a mailing system. We've had to develop a call centre and a booking system to support what will be between 5 and 10 million invitations that we send out. And we've had to build management information systems to underpin that so that we know where to target people, what the optimum distance is from people's homes to people's clinics and, uh, and so on. So we've had to build all that upfront stuff. Then we've had to build the systems within our clinics that deal with consent, with lifestyle questionnaires via touchscreens, with the measures that we take of people, which include heel ultrasound, which will include 12 lead ECG, which include sitting height, standing height, weight, spirometry, <coughs> grip strength, and a whole range of other things, and to integrate those with our IT systems. Uh, we've then got a clinical interview, which is computer-based, and we take the samples, and all of that is bundled up into a data package for each participant and transmitted through into our Oxford interim data center and from there up to our long-term data repository in that building that was on the photographs where we have our laboratory systems, where we have our core HL7 based data repository, where we have our sample archive in this office in Cheadle. So that's what's built at the moment, that's what's running at the moment, that's what's storing the data from, and the samples from 200 and 15,000 people. Data flows are all XML. The LIMS system is provided by a company called Thermo. And the core data repository, I said, was HL7 based. In fact, it's the Oracle healthcare transaction based product. And the next phase will be to start to follow up, to retrieve data from the NHS systems about our consented participants. And the debate around the format and the permissions and the consent will be an interesting one when we get into this. Then the job is to build the interrogation tools that sit on top of the repository so that we understand what we've got, to build the data warehouses on top of that, and to provide the research management layer which will allow people to know what we've got without getting at the fine detail of the personal records, and to enable people to understand what queries they might start to fire at this resource. And ultimately, it looks like this. We've got measurements. We've got questionnaire responses about diet, um, home circumstances, family history, employment, smoking, alcohol, quite intimate details of lifestyle, uh, medications, cognitive function, uh, and so on. So we have got, especially when we bring in all of this external data from hospital systems, from the environmental systems, from diabetic registries and so on, we have got the richest repository of data about our consented patients. And it's interesting to look at the mechanics of this and people's behavior. It would seem to us that when we open one of these assessment centers, it reaches a peak when the population is saturated and then we run it down and close it and move it somewhere else. And that peak is round about 20,000 people per assessment centre. One challenge that I think Biobank will have is to move from an urban 
city environment, large town environment, into capturing the um, rural population. And we have all sorts of management information. This is just one example. So we know for each participant how long they were in clinic, how long they were waiting in clinic, how long the blood samples took, how long the questionnaires took. All of that data is captured and stored. Systems challenges have... They've been quite difficult. It's about balancing the need for resilience and the protection of data and resilience at the level of the IT systems can never fail and therefore pre prevent a person giving us their data. They must be resilient all the way through the system, not just in the repository but in the clinics and elsewhere. How do we preserve security and confidentiality? And we've got a data model with separated identifiers that means that different identifiers are used in every single component of our architecture. So that if anybody within our system wants to look at things they shouldn't be looking at, and our permission should prevent them doing that, but if they got through it, they wouldn't know what it was they were looking at or who it related to. Uh, we're move we've already got compliance with ISO 9000 and Two, we're moving towards compliance with um, uh, other aspects of ISO and FDA compliance and, and, and what have you. We routinely submit all of our systems to external penetration testing so that we know that they're secure. Everything has got an audit trail, so everything is rebuildable. Everything is backed up twice a day. Everything is stored off-site so that we can rebuild things if we need to do it. But the issue is balancing this usability and the constraints on that and the control that we need to have. And it's been interesting to debate this with our ethics uh, and governance committee. And one issue that was quite a, a difficult subject to deal with was withdrawal of consent. A small proportion of our participants have withdrawn consent. What do you do then in systems terms? How do you delete that data, given that you can't ever delete data? How do you take that data out of your multiple versions of backup tapes? How do you prove to the participant that you have actually deleted their data? Big issues around that. Uh, we, we may, at some point, publish how we've done all of this. We've got a big challenge to look at how we control and how we assess the quality of data that we bring in from outside. And the other challenge was the gamble I took early on on going for the HL7 data standard as being the core architectural component of, of Biobank going forward. The management challenges in Biobank were generic. Agreeing what the process was that the systems needed to support and what the data sets were. Balancing the urgency of getting Biobank going with the need to build on strong foundations that will be future-proof for 10, 20, 30 years. Developing a business case for a 10-year vision. It's quite easy to build a business case for something that's a two-year vision where you get payback. This is a 10, 20, 30-year vision. Building for the future, preserving options for the future, so things that can be put off are put off, and creating the infrastructure components around hardware and the major tool sets. All of those were difficult decisions to make. And the money that we got to do that was a small proportion of the overall biobank budget, because the majority of that budget went into recruiting people, into running clinics, and to building the sample stores. And finding the space to collaborate. And what we're seeing in biobank at the moment is every, the team is small. The team is only about 20 people for the world's biggest biobank. And that team is focused on delivering Biobank. And that doesn't give that team the ability or the space to collaborate at a European or a world level in the way that would be nice if we could do it. And I've talked a little bit about standards. We've, we've done work on that. We've, we've achieved that accreditation. We're now moving on the systems accreditation piece. And we have adopted where it suits us the HL7, the CDISC data standards, so that we can make this interoperate with other biobanks so that we can bring data in from other sources more easily than we otherwise would be able to. So in summary on biobank, before I move on to my current challenges, it's on target. Three years ago, I didn't know if I'd ever in my life be able to say it was on target. It is on target. 
Our approach to systems development has been robust and strategic, but in the debate between the long term and the urgent, the urgent has always won. And that's probably not surprising. We won't know if our long term investment in systems and standards is going to pay off probably for another two or three years till we really start to use the resource. And that's proved to me that actually we can do, with a lot less money than we thought, a lot of very innovative work that provides this platform for the future. And I have to say that when I see Biobank periodically in the news, when I hear people talking about Biobank, when I hear my team talking about Biobank, it brings almost a tear to my eye to have gone from those first days of thinking about it to having recruited over 200,000 people. Seeing that become reality truly is amazing. <coughs> and I gave a talk in Germany a couple of weeks ago where the theme they gave me was building the world's most efficient biobank. Is this the world's most efficient biobank? I don't know if it is, and I don't think that that question is remotely relevant. It's one way of doing it. This is a proactive study. This is not about storing tissues from a variety of sources. This is a proactive, designed from scratch study that is operating in a pretty efficient way. The thing to think about is having done this, and this leads into my next section, how will the existence of this massive resource change the way in which resources, research is done in England, in the UK, and in Europe? Because if it doesn't, what's the point? It should mean that people come to Biobank to do research instead of going out to recruit 500, 1,000, 1,500 people for some things. So I was doing that. I did all the thinking behind that. I did all the buying of the hardware and setting up the server rooms and coming up with the strategy and what have you. And then I got dragged, not quite kicking and screaming, into this world that is the National Institute for Health Research, a virtual institute. And I shocked myself when I put that slide up. I was thinking, what was I thinking about putting so much data on one slide? This, this is to show to you the scale of the institute. These are the high-level written descriptions about what the institute is. And there are two pages of them. It is a big virtual institute. It is fundamental to the way that research is managed and funded in England. And I emphasize England. This is an English initiative. <coughs> it's about the funding. It's about the capacity to do research. It's about the NHS. It's about academia. It's about setting up senior investigators and setting up a faculty and setting up leadership programs and having trainees and all this people stuff. It's about the governance applying to health R&D. It's about, here at the bottom, many titles, busting bureaucracy. <laughs> and interestingly, my program is number two. With a little bit of effort from me, the information systems program is seen as a high-level program that underpins the whole of the rest of it. Before I intervened, it was down at 4.2 on the bottom of this slide. It's now way up the top. It's about where research is done in the biomedical research centers and in the biomedical research units. It's about clinical research networks and clinical research programs and so on. It is about the whole of the way health research is done in England. And its origins, in a sense, in two people. The first one is Professor Sally Davis, who's provided the thinking and the muscle to drive this program through. And the other person is Dominic's friend, um, Gordon Brown, our esteemed Prime Minister, who put his name to the strategy that led to this program. And Sally is at pains at every opportunity to point out this isn't a Department of Health initiative, this is a government initiative. It's called Best Research for Best Health. And the aim is to improve the health and the wealth of the nation. Health in terms of better research that leads to better treatments. Wealth in the sense that inward investment, presumably from pharmaceutical companies, will enrich the UK and make the UK the place where research will be done. 
and it consists of, in, in the way of these four components. The faculty, the programs with names like Invention for Innovation, Patient Benefit and Health Technology Assessment, the research networks that have been set up into conditions like cancer and stroke and medicines for children, and the research centers of various different types. So the span is very broad, and my IS program's job is to provide the systems that underpin the whole of that. So this is big national infrastructure stuff. My job description, when Sally asked me to do the job, had two bullet points. Create a program to do this, develop a portal, and bust some bureaucracy. Actually, she only gave me two and three. Develop a portal and bust bureaucracy by joining systems. Up, end of job description, off you pop and do that. And you can have a million pounds in year one to set it up. The purpose of the program, therefore, from those simple bullet points, was to develop a single IT system for researchers and NHS research management. I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. To unify and simplify administrative procedures which were seen as bureaucratic, cumbersome, time-wasting, costly, and so on. To develop a systems architecture that allows the various people engaged in research to interact. To define the standards and the business processes that should underpin that and to be innovative in the use of information systems to improve things for researchers and research managers. And it is great to be given the task to be innovative. So whereas the research capability program is about clinical data, we're about management information and metadata deriving from that clinical data. And this, in my small world, is quite a famous drawing. I spent nine months working with people, trying to work out what it was that I was supposed to be doing. And it was quite clear that every time I had a team meeting, every time I had a meeting with people from outside, they didn't get it. My team didn't get it. Other people outside didn't get it. So in a fit of frustration, in five minutes I drew this diagram on a flip chart, and I said, that's what we're doing. And they all went, oh, we get it now. It's about taking disparate systems and different, uh, in different organizations and providing access to those via a data layer, a, a data management layer, so that we can join this thing up. And it's about defining the interoperability standards and the security standards and everything that goes, goes with that. And I've taken this to the chief executive of the Wellcome Trust, and I've taken this to any number of professors and very clever people, and they said, that's brilliant, that encapsulates the whole thing that we're about. And I've looked at it recently and I thought, actually, that's completely wrong. But it's helped them to get it. This is about defining the world that we've got at the moment, the world that we're trying to transform, is one that has a mentality which is based on forms and data exchange. I think that's the wrong way of approaching this. This is fundamentally about workflow. And therefore, this is what I'm trying to create. The ability to create a longitudinal record that covers the life cycle of an R&D project from the funding phase, through the approvals phase, through the research phase and the recruitment phase, into the publication phase, so that the various people interacting as part of that life cycle can see the bits of it, can contribute the bits of it that are relevant to what they're doing at that time, so they can input it once not multiple times for different agencies. That's what we're trying to do. And that's where this new concept of the longitudinal research record that we're now talking about is coming from. In order to do this, I was given five tasks. The first one was to put in place a single system to enable people doing research in the NHS to obtain permission to do that from a single point, instead of having to go and ask every single hospital if it was doable big workflow type system. The second thing I had to do was to build from scratch a national database of all the health research that was going on. The third one was to, to develop the portal to provide access to all of this. <clears throat> the fourth one was to integrate those systems that are used by our ethics committees to approve uh, the research that they do. 
And the fifth one was to start to build national infrastructure components that allow us to manage information about the people who are involved in research. All of those we're getting on with at the moment. Some of them we've done, the portal we've delivered in, in Microsoft SharePoint with lots of bells and whistles. The national database research, we've got the first iteration out and we're working on the second. But underpinning all of this work, we have done the fundamental work around enterprise architectures, data standards to allow this interoperability, the technical architectures which are unashamedly mainly Microsoft based, and we're starting to build the infrastructure, the data centers, the connections, um, the safe havens that we need to enable this to work. So where are we up to? Portal's in place. It's used as an intranet mainly at the moment. It doesn't have much of a portal um, facing in, in the public direction. Um, and we're using that to re-engineer some of our internal business processes across this virtual national institute. We have delivered, and it went live on the 18th of November, the system that allows NHS permissions to be given through a single point, through a single agent, and all of the complex business process that underpins that. We have released the first version of the portfolio database that will become the national database. And we've delivered other things that we didn't intend to do. We've, we've set up in three months using a radical, agile approach a database of all the GP practices and the research that they're engaged in and the people who are engaged in research, and we've released that via our portal in three months. We've set up our secure hosting facilities at a national level, and we have recruited the fairly sophisticated and quite large team that we need to put this in place, and we're now leading them towards uh, working in the disciplined way that comes through uh, the IT information library standards and, and so on. We've put in place our testing teams, our technical authoring teams. Uh, we've put in place all the di disciplines of good software development and release. And the one thing I want to move on now, and I was working on this very early this morning, is that the carbon footprint of my program is big. I drag people around the country. That's unfortunate. That wrecks their lives. The cost of rail transport in the UK is alarming. Um, a 30-mile journey by car might take you two hours. So implementing communications technologies to underpin my program and to underpin the research networks is where I want to start looking next. But now, given that my job is program director and I need to look forward, I'm saying, are we still true to the vision that was in Gordon Brown's strategy in the first place? Are we really busting bureaucracy? As we build all of these components, are we still true to that vision that we defined in the first place? And that's where... Over the next two months, I'm going to be challenging my team to go back to first principles and say, if we had a clean piece of paper, if we could build the most optimal systems, if systems could drive business process, what would those systems be like? And then I think my job is to create the air cover to allow my team to create the demonstrators that might show to people how this could be done properly. So... Things that have made me think this week, and I'll let you download this presentation and you can investigate these for yourself. First one is a presentation from somebody who was Chief Information Officer for Westchester County in New York, who now works for Cisco. A fascinating presentation that says national initiatives can never work, because they can never keep pace with the people that they're supposed to be delivering benefit for particularly at the moment in a fa with a Facebook generation with people who are really turned on to different ways of collaborating and social networking, institutionalized national initiatives rarely work. Scary second one. Computer virus affects hospitals in London. Three London hospitals shut down all their systems last week because of a virus. Third one, very close to home, the black Porsche here, which you can't see, very relevant. My GP drives a black Porsche just like that, and he has the keys on his desk while you're in consultation. <laughs> GPs are focusing on patients who bring in bonuses. So this drive to performance-related, quality-of-care-related uh, initiatives, um, 
in the UK that I delivered the systems to underpin them is having pernicious effects in other areas. People with pulmonary eosinophilia suddenly find them classed as having cells classed as having asthma because guess what? You get paid extra for asthma treatment and you don't have pulmonary eosinophilia. Some of these initiatives have weird effects that you might not have predicted. I was reading this on the plane coming over, very frightening. A locum GP saw an elderly man with a chest infection and said, you need to take um, penicillin. And he said, I can't take penicillin, I'm very allergic to it. And she says, but there's nothing on your electronic record to say that, therefore I insist that you should take penicillin. He took it and half an hour later he died. We have created a world with these systems where the fact that somebody forgot to transfer a 20-year-old diagnosis of allergy to penicillin from a paper note onto a computer meant that a doctor believed the computer more than she believed the patient and his wife who were telling her. These are things that start to frighten me about the world I've helped to create. Another thing, this was right in my face last Monday before I flew out. Massive Guardian front page article about how it's disgraceful that the NHS should want to use its resource to educate and involve patients in research more. How that was a massive invasion of, pri of privacy that would ultimately lead to 50 million patients being coerced into trials of new drugs. Deeply frightening because of the bias there is in that article. Deeply frightening because actually in Biobank where we've recruited 200,000 people, people understand the issues and want to participate on the right terms with people that they trust. But this is the headline debate that is getting in the way of this. So I'm moving quickly, I'm conscious that I'm close to end of my time, but so what am I learning from all of this, having raced through National Programme for IT and, and through biobanking and, and, and uh, through my current programme. What I'm learning about scale is it's not surprising that given the scale of our aspiration in the UK and the, the scale of our investment, that this attracts media attention. And in five minutes Googling last week, I found those five stories. And that is the degree of media exposure that there is. This makes the authorities defensive, unimaginative, and risk averse. That's not going to lead to innovation. It's led me to the conclusion, actually, that high top-down initiatives rarely or never work because they're too slow and can't keep pace with users or technology. And that's pretty much what the CIO from New York was saying. It's not surprising because inevitably with initiatives like this, more energy goes into running the program than into delivering the applications. And they also alienate, because of the scale of them and because the headlines and so on, they alienate the very people that they're intended to help. And they absolutely stifle innovation because everybody becomes risk averse. What am I learning in terms of approach? The benefits realization is poorly understood and rarely addressed properly, and the same is true of user engagement, by which I mean patients. What I see a lot of is tokenistic patient involvement, and not enough people thinking about their own mothers and their own selves and their own wives in the way they deliver systems. I see something which is actually something that somebody like me shouldn't say. I see clearly that information system development should be driven by business priorities, but the massive gulf between business and IS and is leading to a world where the rich potential of information systems isn't being realized. And what I'm starting to do with my teams now is say, let's trust our understanding. Let's start to build systems that we believe a system specialist can actually transform the way in which healthcare is delivered, delivered and which business processes can then be re-engineered around the potential that those systems will deliver. 
This requires imagination and bravery and air cover from people like me to set up those teams and wind them up and set them off to deliver really innovative solutions, which is sort of Skunk's Works approach. And I think within my teams now, we've got the technology and the skills to do this. And finally, so I've, I've done a lot of stuff over the last few years. I've had a lot of opportunities that many people don't get. I've helped to implement fairly sophisticated clinical systems. I've helped to connect the NHS, which has had all sorts of spin-off benefits. I've helped GPs get paid a lot more money and buy cars that I can only aspire to. I've implemented lab results. I've built systems that make the public more aware about research, public more able to participate in research, that enable health researchers to work more effectively, and that support this massive drive to put more money into health research in the UK. And I've also helped build what is at the moment the world's biggest data and sample store to support research, which is UK Biobank. So what? What is the impact that all of this has had on people like me? Conditions I've got is pulmonary is in a nice word, quite a pair of words, quite difficult to spell. Nobody knows what it means. It's just a name for a collection of symptoms that relate to allergies and stuff. And nobody knows how to treat it. And now over the last six months, I've suddenly got type 2 diabetes and high cholesterol and hypertension. Which probably means I should sit down in a moment. And my healthcare providers are my GP, a local hospital, a teaching hospital in Manchester, which is 20 miles up the road, and my local pharmacy. So how are the systems that I've built and other people have built supporting my healthcare? Well, guess what? My GP still writes to my hospital consultant in a letter, and the consultant writes back to him. I implemented the systems that enable lab results to be integrated into GP systems, and lo and behold, they are. Which means that I know, because my wife works in the lab, my lab results within two hours of the needle coming out of my arm. I know that that data is in my GP system, fully integrated in 24 hours. You ring up the GP to ask for them, and she says, oh no, they're not in yet, it will take a week. So we've implemented the systems, and it's made no difference at all. And that is scary when you know that the results are abnormal, which quite often I do. Believe it or not, my GP writes to me asking me to make an urgent appointment. I get a nice letter in a nice envelope with a stamp on it. Sent second class, so it takes three days to arrive. My hospital consultant, who is a brilliant man, I like him a lot, he cares massively about my health, he writes notes about my appointments on the back of the referral letter. And he's got a terminal in his office with two screens, but he still writes the notes on the back of the referral letter. It takes a week to get a repeat prescription. If I'm coming to Canada and I realise I'm running out of my statin or whatever it is, and uh, I need some quickly, it takes a week to get some more. My blood test results are stored in three systems in three different hospitals. There is no trend monitoring across this. My GP doesn't know what my consultant's prescribed, and my consultant doesn't know what my GP's prescribed, and neither knows what I actually take. And this thing around my neck, that's my integrated record. Which I can't, the writing's so small I can't even read what's on it. But that's the only thing that says vaguely what I'm taking and what might be wrong with me. But great news, I can book an appointment with my GP on the internet, <laughs> which is really useful. So what this looks like to me, and I did get the guitar picture in at some point. Um, I've got this doctor who's got that. I've got that doctor who's got those bits. He's interested in involving me in a clinical trial, so that data goes in some other system. This doctor's got that because I fall off my bicycle and I break bones and I get bitten by my three Irish setters and all the rest of it. I see my pharmacist who's got the only record of what drugs I've dispensed. I see my optician who is the person who actually diagnosed diabetes, not my doctor. And I've got my own records, and actually my own records are the best ones in terms of peak flow, in terms of blood pressure, 
and blood glucose and so on. And that's what it looks like to me. That is a complete mess and the potential for systems to improve that is very significant indeed. But the will and the permissions you need to create a world where that can happen I think may be insurmountable problems. And that's what it could look like. And that's what I'd like to see it look like. And I have no problem with the consent and the permissions associated with that. I don't care if somebody leaks the fact that I broke my collarbone in 1986, quite frankly. But perhaps I don't think I have any embarrassing conditions that I'd rather were kept secret. And I think we need to build some rules around that. And that data would be very useful to support research. And I think around that we need to place some intelligence and some knowledge. And what I'm not seeing in the UK is what I hope I'm going to talk about next. I, I think what I'm seeing in the UK is people, an investment that has gone into creating an electronic record service. We have given people lots of computers to store a lot of information about what's going on now. But what we've not got is the capability for that to support electronic patient care, which is a step beyond, and I see no activity, certainly in the UK, focused on that at the moment. What I would like to see is people in my practice looking at my record across the whole of my life and saying, do you realise that when this man takes prednisolone, two months later, his blood glucose goes up or his peak flow goes down? What I see is reactive events monitoring systems all the way through and no attention being paid to the longitudinal uh, study. What I think is that if you start to combine that way of working and you take that data about lots and lots of people and whole community populations, then you can start to form some fairly radical views on how health services could be delivered differently, about the prevalence of disease, and about the relationship between um, medications and outcomes and so on. Big opportunities that are being missed in these national infrastructure initiatives, I think. I think we've got to think more about how people use systems in healthcare and which people use them and can access them. I think we've got to get more of a focus on the people and the researchers and the benefits of truly integrated records with some patient involvement and less of a focus on the record keeping and the infrastructure. And to do that requires trust. And in a world where the media is so focused on what you're doing, establishing that level of trust is quite difficult. And it requires fundamental rethinking, which in my view should be led by caring clinicians, as opposed to clinicians who aspire to driving Porsches and not much else, and informaticians and patients. And I now absolutely believe, having led five national programs, that the only place this can work is at a small level, at a local level, and in natural communities, based on real patient use cases, not hypothetical ones, but real ones. I think I, I'm an interesting one and a challenging one, but I very much doubt that I'm unique. And I'm sorry I've overrun a fraction. I hope that's vaguely acceptable, but I'm open for any discussions you wish. Steve, thank you. Uh, that, that was incredible to, to see what you've uh, done here and uh, uh, we'd like to have a chance to ask questions or make comments about this and uh, as you were talking at the beginning I reflected that uh, knowing the situation in the world right now it seemed that you had done more single-handedly to cause unemployment in, in Britain by taking all the jobs but I see you've been doing a good job at doing it too so wow. the, uh, it's an amazing set of things you've undertaken so questions comments We'll get you a microphone. Yeah. Would this data be available to researchers? Not just the data itself. Like, not if researchers just interested in doing data mining, for instance, without having to uh, ask to conduct other tests on the patients in it. Is it publicly available, or will it be publicly well, available? It, it for sure. You're talking about UK Biobank. Um, for yeah. sure, yes. it isn't available right now. The, 
the core of UK biobank data, which relates to real identifiable human beings. This isn't anonymized. This, this has got to be identifiable in order for us to follow people up. We'll never, in my view, be made available to researchers. But what we need to do is to build a metadata layer on top of that. And then the debate is how much of that will you allow researchers to get into. And that poses all sorts of systems challenges. It's entirely feasible to conceive of somebody writing a SQL statement to extract everything about everything and bringing all of our systems down. Uh, so there is a big, big, big debate to be had around that. My personal view, and I have to tell you that my involvement in Biobank at the moment is about one minute per week, because my other things take a lot of my time, is that we have got to publish as much de detail as it's safe to do in order that people can understand what we've got and understand what sort of questions they, they can fire at us. And... I believe that we should do that. Whether it will happen, I'm not sure. At what level of detail that information will be available, I'm not sure. And the other thing I believe is that we need to start to publish some of that data for public health benefit as well, which is not one of the primary purposes, I don't think, of UK Biobank. But I think the fact that we've got all that data means that it should be used for that purpose as well. But I, I think the debate around how the resource is used and therefore what business processes and what technical systems need to underpin that is one that we're not quite at yet. But it's very clear that from a patient point of view, their aim is for this to be about sharing, about intelligence, and about ultimate benefit. And you can't deliver that if it's a closed book. Just a question. I mean, how will it be used? I mean, what is the primary few uses for Biobank? How is it planned to be used? <coughs> I think multiple reasons. I think if you look at uh, Professor Collins and his team in Oxford, who are now the main um, drivers of this, they're epidemiologists. So their first thoughts are about epidemiology. But I, I can't escape the fact that drug discovery is one of the things that patients want us to, um, to enable. And therefore, one would presume that those samples would be retrieved, they would be subjected to all sorts of, of processing, and those results fed back to the pharmaceutical sponsors or, or whoever it might be. The big debate then becomes, do you feed the results of that back into the common data pool, or is that restricted IPR to the person who asked the question in the first place? And is that time limited or is it not? Because it's quite possible to conceive, if you follow that argument to its conclusion, that you ultimately deplete the resource and there's nothing left. But I, I think there will be international debate through the international review committees and so on about the optimal use of Biobank. And I think Biobank, which is both a charity and a limited company, will always have in the back of its mind, how do we get the most value out of the precious resource we've got. There is the potential to, to recall patients and to take more samples and to expand the sample size. But I think always in the back of our, our minds will be how do we get the most value out of what we've got. Thank you, over here. Thanks again for, uh, for coming out. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you have your... Um, you mentioned that when you bring your blood results in, they're put into the system within 24 hours, yet it is taking two weeks for you to get these. Why do you think it is? Is it the case where the nurse is simply not aware that the results have been put in, she hasn't been trained to utilize the system, or the case there's already systems in place in the office, or some other level where things left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing? I think... It's a mindset and how you run general practice issue and what's the role of general practice in general health care issue. I think it's about the SOP and the practice, particularly my practice perhaps, um, for how the world works. Um, they want to move at the pace that they're comfortable with. Um, and I, I think there is just a script that says, oh, thank you for ringing up. When did you have your blood taken? The results will be available in one week. I think that's what it is. It's no more complicated than that. Thank you. And that, that's a bit sad. And, and actually, that's really hard to deal with. 
just wanted there's a question from the web, I believe, and then I'll come over to John. Yes, um, a question on the web. Is there concern that? Oh, it just moved on me. Is there concern that privacy concerns on the part of the patients? mental health, heart disease, STDs, HIV, could skew research studies? Yes, I, I think there is. And I, I think that um, the debate around those, those issues has been confusing and has been, has been based around the big national initiatives like the National uh, Programme for IT and so on. Um, to the extent that... Um, in, in, the, in the early days of um, the national program for IT, the concept was that there would be a national spine record that would have most of the significant events relating to a person's current health available so that if a man who lived in Brighton got knocked down in Bradford through this national infrastructure, people could see that data. And ultimately, because of this debate, that rich record got watered down to current medications and current allergies. So there is no doubt that the issues around this, the, the conceptual issues around privacy will skew the information that's available to people, including researchers, potentially. And that flags will be set within records, and this is part of the National Programme for IT that I'm not too familiar with, that say which bits of the record may or may not be shared. And inevitably, if um, that will exclude some things that researchers would be interested in. Whether this applies in UK biobanks is a different issue um, because we have a, a lot of questions that are answered following our consent process that are aimed at enabling us to have a rich source of accurate data from these people with the ability for them to say, I choose not to answer in certain circumstances. But maybe biobank will have a richer set of information about those people than the health services generally would do. Yeah, for, first, uh, an exchange of information. After 72 minutes, uh, Liverpool are beating Marseille 1-0 and Chelsea are beating Bordeaux 1-0. Just thought you might be interested. Oh, in how disappointing. They... <laughs> but Macclesfield beat Grimsby 1-0 last night and that's all I care about. <laughs> um, I was fascinated by the topic you were brought up briefly on ethics. You know, as somebody who, who often attempts to do multi-center research, um, you know, one of the most difficult aspects of that is coordinating ethical reviews, getting yeah. ethical approval at different institutions. And I, I think you you hinted that that there'd been some activity in trying to get a sort of national national ethics issues dealt yes. with in this in this project. I just want you to comment a bit further on that. Um, I can do. I, I, I'm conscious that I raced through that at about 200 miles an hour. Um, the perception is that ethics approvals is bureaucratic. Uh, the reality is that that was true two, three years ago, but a lot of work has gone on uh, through national systems to make that predictable and to make it systems-based and to make it work. Um, and uh, a national system through our um, uh, National Ethics Coordinating Centre has been in place now for a, a year or two. And what they're doing now is bolting onto the front of that data capture capability so that patient information advisory, all the regulatory stuff, is captured through a single form front end and then sent off to the... Um, MHRA, the Devices Regulatory Agency, uh, is sent off to the Patient Information Advisory Group, is sent off to the Human Tissue Authority and various other people through that central coordinating center. So that bit of bureaucracy has been improved significantly. Um, technologically, I have some problems with the way in which it's been done, but in business terms, that works very well. So what we can do now is bolt those systems onto our national infrastructure and join them up to the fund the funding phase and the, um, and the, the uh, recruitment phase to, to start to streamline the whole of that. Uh, and I don't know, maybe we're unique in the way that we've done that. Um, and that, that seems to be working and getting good press at the moment. Um, <coughs> Steve, uh, I believe the reason that you came over this time was uh, a visit to NIH uh, and the CA Big projects. Could you tell us a bit about what CA Big is about and 
the relationship with the work that you're doing? Um, yeah, there's an interesting story because I, I, I never got to Washington. Um, and it wasn't just because I took a wrong turning on the interstate out, out of Philadelphia. Um, the CA Big project um, and the work that the NCI and the NIH are doing generally around systems in Washington is, is very large scale and very interesting and has got many facets to it. The bit that I was going to talk to them about in particular was um, an open source approach to the development of systems to support clinical trials, uh, which they're working on, and they're working on the, the enterprise architectures for that, the data standards for that, and also some of the applications for that. Uh, the other work that they're doing is to do with connecting um, worldwide stores of cancer-related information so, and, and putting uh, web portals on the front of those so that researchers can see what information is available to support research across the world. Um, and I was going to talk to them about the potential for collaboration, the potential for us to adopt the information system standards that they're using within our architectures um, in order to create the potential to join these things up across the Atlantic and elsewhere. Um, having missed the opportunity this time to um, to see them, I, I guess that meeting will take place um, when I'm next over in January. But there is massive amount of work going on there. It's all based on open source, um, which for us is a little bit of a problem because we've nailed our colors to a Microsoft mast for a variety of reasons that I can talk about if you really want me to. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential there for us to learn from what they're doing. And on biobanking, there's a lot of potential for them to learn from what we're doing. So um, we're from Toronto, and we've um, we run, work in a biobank, and we're building an IT system, oh, or gosh. a BIMS, the Biobank Information Management System. That's so what they call the one in Sweden as well. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, so we're looking at various uh, companies that are out there that have biobanking solutions, such as LabVantage. Um, mm. Genealogics is a new one that's out there. There's various ones that are out there. We're also now looking at um, CA Tissue Suite, mm -hmm. that was one of those CA Big free yep. downloads that you're able to start with. Um, I was curious as to your system. So, did you build it from scratch? Did you use some other tools? Do you have any any help? <laughs> um, I can tell you a story. Um, and I might need to think about the words I use carefully so as not to be libelous to large blue companies. Um, when I first got involved in biobanking, when frankly I didn't know what biobanking was about and therefore I was coming to this with a fresh mind, uh, there were gentlemen from um, this large company who said, we know the solution. Um, and, and we will help you write your strategy and we will help you define your business processes and we will we will do that £50,000, we will do it in three months. And I said, well, gosh, that's really good return on, on investment. You do that, and I can sit here and wait, and then when you've told me what to do, I'll just go and do it. Of course, they hadn't a clue how to do it at all. They, was, they were three months late in a three-month project, and in the end, I wrote most of it. So there are many people who feel they've got the solution. And if you go and talk, one person I would talk to via email, and I can put you in contact with him if you want to, is Jan Eric Litton from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Um, because his biobank, it seems to me, may have some similarities to what you've done. He's implemented IBM solutions. They've worked very well, but they have been, they've worked very well because the people in Sweden have worked out how to use them and they've customized them uh, and so on. Um, UK Biobank was different. UK Biobank is simple. It's about logistics, it's about recruitment of people, it's about us controlling the quality of the data that we get, and it's about blood samples and urine samples full stop. So we're not dealing with complex um, archives of, uh, of various tissues. Um, the way we did this was that 
IBM were very keen to sell as a systems solution. And we bought beautiful hardware from them, and I'm grateful to them for selling that to me at a, a relatively low price, and it's worked very well ever since. Um, their system solution, their application solution, to me was too complex. The dependence on the supplier was significantly more than I wanted. The flexibility was hard to understand, and it wasn't standards-based. And my gamble was that if I want to bring in routinely collected health data, I don't want to be transforming that. I want minimal manual intervention on that going forward. Um, and therefore, I ought to be operating to the standards that the people in healthcare are starting to work to, which was HR7 and, uh, and, and, so, and SNOMED and, and, and so on. And I looked for a solution that might fit. Now, Mr. Oracle came with his shiny shrink wrap package and said, actually, Steve, think about biobanking as a generic health pr process. You're running a clinic, that's the same as running an outpatient clinic. You're collecting samples, that's what happens in hospitals. And their argument was persuasive. And they also did a wonderful economic deal. Being biobank, we got offered lots of stuff very cheaply, and we took advantage of that. We never took anything for free. We always paid, paid for it, but um, we got some great deals. And this was the Oracle HTB suite. I have to tell you, it's taken us two years to configure that. The data has been sitting in interim secure data stores that we've built before we could transfer it into the long-term repository. That's because Oracle at that stage, early in the life cycle of that product, didn't understand it enough. It's because the configuration of it was fiendishly complicated. It's because we had to program the interface layers to that and the transform layers that converted questionnaires into HL7 and stuff that we would have had to do anyway. So the row I had with my chief executive that resulted in me saying to him, sack me now, literally, standing up at the conference table and saying, sack me now, was, Steve, your systems are taking years to implement, and I haven't got years. Why couldn't you just write this in Access or something in a way that you store the questionnaire and you store the sample results and you store the other stuff? If I had my time over again, would I do the same thing? No, I wouldn't, in truth. I would write from scratch a standards-based data repository of my own, because that would have been quicker than taking that commercial product. Interesting. You know, if you're interested, uh, we have very good uh, scientific collaborations and, and, and connections with CA Big in the United States and the, and the chief health informatics people, and there might be people who could advise you on specific systems. but. Uh, this is a pretty classical problem uh, related to new kinds of ventures is that the technology that's being used is not specific to them and you're trying to bend things that you need to accomplish into that technology. Uh, so that it, it's a very interesting problem and we see that in other dimensions like in enterprise resource management systems and so on where yeah. huge implementation time. One hospital here in Ontario planned to spend I think it was six million on an enterprise resource management system. This is all the uh, human resources and finance systems and so on. Uh, and they called it ERP at the time, enterprise resource planning. And uh, it ended up costing them in excess of 17 million dollars. Very, very common story. So very interesting and it, I think it would be very useful uh, from our side here to tap you with regard to that and, and make sure people know about your existence and experience so that uh, that information gets over here uh, to Canada. I'd be very happy if I can fit it into my daily life. It would only be a 25% increase in your number of jobs. Don't worry about to, it. It's easy. To, to help people in any way that I can. I'm, I'm, sure. I mean that really. We've, we've learned lessons in biobanking that you could exemplify that last bit of debate in a very short sentence. It was an argument about thinking generically and laterally and flexibly and being pragmatic and bespoke. And I went for the first knowing that in the short term that that was high risk and not knowing whether the payback from that would ever arise. Um, as I said, if I did it again, I'd do it slightly differently, but the same principles would apply. Well, unfortunately, we've, as usual, we've run out of time. Um, uh, there are a number of questions I wanted to ask you, but um, 
the, uh, I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity to get you back here again and, uh, and really um, get some interaction going with you despite your busy schedule. But I uh, personally wanted to thank you not only for coming here, but how you came here, driving all the way from Philadelphia. That's my former hometown, <laughs> and I know the distance, um, and uh, making the effort to... Uh,